if you are a fan of professional golf, this is a big weekend. This is Masters weekend. Can I get an amen on that? No, don't don't amen me that. Don't amen me on that. I have a I have a friend back on the East Coast that every year on what he called Masters Sunday, he wore a green jacket to church. <laughs> he said that's the only green jacket he'd ever have because he was never. That's what they give the winner. They also make about two mil, but they get a green jacket too as well. And so I am a fan of professional golf. I am a terrible player of the game, but I enjoy watching it. I was watching the coverage day before yesterday, and there's a young man who's in contention today named Justin Thomas. And they were just talking to him because he, if you know about golf and professional circles, they play four rounds, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, typically. And so Thursday, Justin had a terrible round. It just didn't go well for him. Friday, it was a lot better. And so they're interviewing him after the round on Friday. And, and they said, so basically, Justin, what happened yesterday? You kind of lost a wheel. And he said, you know, here's the thing. He said, I think in any venture in life, what you discover is every day you wake up, you're not that enthused about it. He said, every day you're just not a game material. And he said, I woke up Thursday morning and I just wasn't feeling it. And he said, the problem was I was had to play the first round of the Masters. That's not a good time to not feel it, so to speak. But he dialed it back in on Friday. And I think yesterday as well. And that's what it really takes to win that sort of a sporting event. One of the most difficult courses in America is you have to have laser focus. You've got to stay on it. And I don't mean just every day and not just even every hole. You have to be focused every single shot. Because one shot, you can lose the tournament. And if you think about it, that's probably true of all professional sports, the, the people that excel are those that have that laser focus that no matter what the distraction on, and may I say off the field, they stay focused. And I'll take it one more step in our secular world, probably the job that you do your best when you're laser focused, aren't you? When you're kind of just phoning it in, which we all do from time to time, that may not be the best day. And probably not the day you need to do something that's going to make a difference in your business. I want to talk to you about a much more important laser focus than professional sports or the job that you do today. I want to talk to you about the laser focus that Jesus had. As we're here this morning... Remembering Palm Sunday, the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem, the beginning of the week that would end with his crucifixion and resurrection. I want you to think this morning about the laser focus that Jesus had to make that happen. Where I get this idea from is I was looking through the different gospel accounts this week, and I was led, and this is going to be our focal text this morning, though we're going to go a lot of places around it. Luke chapter 9, verse 51. And this phrase in this verse, which I've read many, many times in my life, just really caught my attention. And I don't know if you have this experience when you read the Word of God sometimes. Just a a phrase or a word or a verse, and you read it, and you just can't let go of it. It just keeps rolling around in your heart and your mind, and you're, and you're really not able to get away from it. I, matter of fact, I think that's times we need to really take seriously the scripture, scripture edict to meditate upon it and to consider what it means for you in your life. But Luke writes this, Now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. What's that all about? 
Well, the first part of that verse, when the time came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, when Jesus knew that it was time for him to make his way toward the cross, when all the preparatory had been done, it says that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. I, I think that's just an amazing verse. And I, I started looking around at this phrase, steadfastly set his face. And it's referred to as a Hebraism, something that would have been known in the Hebrew language. And so you see it because of that. You see it show up in the Old Testament quite a bit. Um, but interestingly enough, most of the time when that phrase is used in the Old Testament, it's used against something. So, for example, and, and I'm not going to read all these verses. I, you know, if you you go look it up, you can Google it or go get your Strong's Concordance. You can find it. And that'd be good a good exercise for you. But I'll give you the breadcrumbs at least. In the book of Leviticus, we see it, and it's usually where God God the Father sets His face against those who practice sin. Sets His face against. In Jeremiah, God got it a little bit closer in. And if I say Jeremiah, you should think Jerusalem, because that's what that's all about. God sets his face against Jerusalem because of their sin. Ezekiel, the prophet, has several instances of God setting his face against sin in his book. As a matter of fact, the only place that I could find where there was somebody who set their face toward something was in 2 Kings 12. And there we see the king of Syria setting his face toward Jerusalem himself. But for a very different reason than Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. The king of Syria set his face toward Jerusalem because he wanted to attack and defeat it. And so this phrase, to steadfastly set one's face, means also to strengthen or to establish. And so the idea behind this phrase is that this speaks to Jesus' resolve and Jesus' commitment to the mission that God had given him. And if you think about what Jesus was facing, you start to realize just how amazing this was. I mean, how many of us, when we know we've got a stressful meeting that we're going to or a stressful family gathering. Some of us have those. Stressful anything. Just fill in the blank. Or just going, yeah, baby, bring it. We don't like that stuff, do we? It's not that we're necessarily afraid. We just don't want to deal with it. I, at least that's, that's where I live. Um, and sometimes possibly we are afraid. I remember when I took scuba diving lessons many, many years ago now. The one thing that the instructor kept telling us, this was a demotivator for me, he would say, when you go down, don't hold your breath because you can die from a brain embolism in four feet of water. Now, for all the other stuff that he taught me, that's the only thing I remembered. So I remember the first night that we were going to go in a pool, a swimming pool, and put on the tanks and the fins, and the masks, and we were actually going to go try out diving. I was, I was distracted by two things. One, I was distracted by the fact that I've, I've worn glasses since I was 11, and I had never seen clearly in a swimming pool before. But now I had a set of goggles, and I got the prescription ones, which is pretty cool, and I realized how gross the bottom of public swimming pools are. <laughs> That distracted me quite a bit. It's like, that's a Band-Aid. Get away from that. I'm not a germaphobe, but it was pretty funky at the bottom of that, that pool at the YMCA. And the other thing that was just totally distracting me was, I'm going to die in four feet of water. And so I got I to gotta tell you, as I put that strap, that tank on, and went down the steps into the pool, I was, you know, just this little song was going through my head. Da, 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 da. I was like, end of the story was when I actually went down, put my face in the water, started paddling around. I was like, this is cool. All that fear just washed away. But, you know, just think about that, that, that dread. That's what I'm talking about. Just that, that sense of foreboding 
this is not going to be good. Jesus knew what was coming, and yet he stuck right at what the mission was. Let me give you an idea of how much Jesus knew what was going to happen. Because remember, we started in Luke chapter 9, right? That's a long way to get to the end of the gospel. In Luke chapter 9, but look at what he says just up ahead of that. In this chapter, Luke 9, verses 18 through 21. If, you're, if you've got your Bibles, look at that with me. And it says, And it happened as he was alone praying, and he, and he asked them, his disciples, saying, Who do crowds say that I am? And they answered and said, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others say that one of the old prophets has risen. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, The Christ of God. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Folks, this wasn't Jesus saying, guys, I, I, something bad might be coming. I'm not sure what it is, but I'm just kind of getting a bad feeling in my stomach about this. No, he knew chapter and verse on what was going to happen. And this wasn't long before what I read to you about setting his face. By the way, this is um, the parallel to Matthew's gospel where right after that, Peter says, no, Lord, that's not going to happen. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. That's, that's that run up. Just down a, a few verses, down in verse 43, right before what I just read to you at the beginning, it says, and they were all, um, this is after Jesus had healed a man. They'd come down from the Mount of Transfiguration and he had, he had, he had healed this man and uh, who, who was possessed with spirits, and it says, and they were all amazed at the majesty of God, but while everyone marveled at all the things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, let these words sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But Luke records this in verse 45, but they did not understand the saying, and it was hidden from them, so they did not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Now move along a little bit. This this was this all was happening six to eight months before the events of that first Palm Sunday, just to give you an idea and a feel for when we're talking about. Let's get us a little closer to that time. Over in Luke 18, Jesus is getting near Jericho. They're getting ready to climb the road from Jericho to Jerusalem for what would be that triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And it says in verses 31 through 34 of Luke chapter 18, this ain't easy to do with a microphone. Just got to say that. And he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man, that's him, will be accomplished. And he will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him. And the third day... He will rise again. But they understood none of these things. The saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things which were spoken. So, folks, please get this. Jesus was not caught by surprise in Jerusalem at all. That in and of itself is enough, right? I mean, remember what we're talking about this morning. This laser focus that Jesus has to know what's coming his way and yet to stay the course. Now, I didn't say this, but I think I need to circle around just to say this little thing. That verse from Luke 9.51 that says he set his face toward Jerusalem. He didn't go there directly. He would make one more pass up through Galilee and then make his way down. But that was in his mind the entire time. That's where I'm going. Maybe you're familiar with this phrase, doubling down. You guys know that? It's like, like somebody questions you about something that you say, and instead of maybe backing off a little bit, you're like, not only that, boom, right? You double down on them. I love that, by the way. That's commitment, man. I love that. Folks, Jesus doubled down. He'd already told the disciples everything that was going to happen. Now, granted, they did not understand. After his resurrection, they got it. Okay? 
I honestly think that that was the Lord just kind of <laughs> saving their minds because they, they were already kind of torn up without fully understanding what was going on. But then Jesus arrives in Jerusalem. And I don't think there's any mistaking that when he came to town, that he did everything that he needed to do to make sure that the people who were going to put him on the cross knew he was there. There have been times before where Jesus kind of slipped in and he did what he needed to do because it wasn't his time. It wasn't his time, but now it was. That's what Luke 9.51 says. When he realized the time was there, it's time to go. He wanted to make sure there was no mistake. And that trip to Jerusalem was not going to be a wasted trip. Let me give you three that we see in the gospel accounts. And I'm kind of bouncing between different ones. And I'll read you a couple of things along the way just to give you, again, some breadcrumbs. But first off, when he came into Jerusalem that Palm Sunday, he rode in on a donkey. That mattered. When he rode in on that donkey, folks, this was for maximum effect. John and Matthew and their Gospels both connect that action with prophecy. It actually goes back to Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And I'm not going to read that, but what I'm going to read is what Matthew says about that. If, you, if you're not familiar with Matthew's Gospel, Matthew was writing to a Jewish readership. And so what he did very often in his Gospel was that he would talk about something that Jesus did or said, and then he would connect that those thoughts or those actions to the Old Testament Scriptures to tell his Jewish readers, this is Jesus fulfilling the prophecy. This is the Messiah. This is the one that you've been waiting for. And so in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, it says now, this verse 1, it says, Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. I just love the fact Jesus had that all set up. He hadn't made it to town yet, and he had it all set up. Here's what Matthew says in verses 4 and 5. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. This was answered prophecy. And folks, not only was it answered prophecy, this was messianic prophecy. This was pointing to the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, the one who would deliver the people from their sin. And, and the challenge is that a lot of people didn't see it, but the ones who were paying attention, they got it. They recognized what was happening. But you see, I think the reason that so many people maybe didn't get it is because they weren't looking for the kind of Messiah that Jesus was and is. They were looking for the conquering hero. They were looking for somebody to come in on a stallion that was going to bring in, in his army that was going to be able to destroy the Romans who had them in subjection. Not the king who would come in lowly on a donkey as a servant to save man from his sin. Secondly, after Jesus gets there, the Gospels record that he just kind of kept a low profile and just kind of waited for things to happen. No! What did he do? He went into the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers. Folks, that is not low profile. And what you have to know about that is that it's very likely that the religious leaders in Jerusalem were getting a kickback from the profits that were being made by the money changers. What were they doing? They were just tra trading the different currencies into the temple currency so that they could give to the temple, but they were taking their cut. Kind of like those payday loan places on the mainland, right? I mean, they don't do that for free. 
And so, but imagine that every time they make a profit on that, they're handing some to the local pastors. That's what was happening in Jerusalem. And so, I want to be honest with you. I think that probably the religious leaders would have maybe let Jesus slip on what they considered to be his radical theology. But now he's messing around with their income. And it's a funny thing. People let you get away with a whole lot of things, but you start messing with the paycheck. They get pretty gnarly, don't they? All right, so he's ridden in on the donkey. He's turning over the tables. And then if that wasn't enough, I can't read all this to you this morning for lack of time, but I want you to mark this down. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23 is the woe sermon. W-O-E. Woe. And folks, this is, this is what I refer to as a polemic speech. This is Jesus speaking out against. And who is he speaking out against? He's speaking out against the religious elite, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders. In that speech, many times, he refers to them with this lovely, caring word. Hypocrites! Not only that, he refers to them as blind guides. Absolutely going to endear you with people on that one. He also calls them serpents and refers to them as a brood of vipers. That is not in Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Well, they influence people quite well. Now, over in Mark, Mark gives us a synopsis. So I'll read you that. This, this will give you kind of the flavor of what Jesus was saying, just, just so you can kind of get a sense of it. And you can go back there and read Matthew 23, and it'll give you the full technicolor version of it. But Mark 12, 38 through 40, we, we, we read this. This is just Mark's encapsulation. And then he said to them in his teaching, Beware of the scribes who desire to go about in long robes, love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Folks, that's three verses. Matthew got a whole chapter of that. Yikes. Now, I think some people today would probably say that Jesus was not very nice when he said all that. They needed to hear it. The people needed to hear it. Sometimes the truth isn't very nice. And I think we've become very milk toasty. Just, just commentary. Very milk toasty in the 21st century. And, and we have so misused the, the instruction to speak the truth with love. And, and you guys know our rail on this every so often. People today, if you're their friend, they just want you to affirm them. Just, just, just support me. Man, love sometimes has edges to it. Love sometimes, you have to hack people off. It seems like I quoted this verse a whole lot these days, but Hebrews 10, 24 says, let us consider one another to stir up love and good works. And that word stir up there means provoke. That means sometimes when you love somebody and you tell them the truth, they may not be very happy with you. Maybe that's a good time not to double down, by the way. But... Jesus was speaking truth to a group of people who were in bondage to the religious elite. They were in bondage. That's why, that was the whole point when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you because it's light. These people were so saddled down with human law, with legalism, that they, they saw no way out. And the rest of the New Testament is about the grace of God, not the law. There's so many people in our churches today who want everybody to toe their line. It doesn't matter whether you please me or not. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you please one. And that's Him, the one who died for you. I'm not going to die for you. Sorry, don't be disillusioned by that, but you probably wouldn't die for me either. Jesus did. He's the one that we please. 
not each other. If we're on the same page in the Holy Spirit, everything else is going to work out. People are under such bondage today. And Jesus, as he speaks to these religious leaders today, he's calling them out because here's the, here's the main point. And why I think churches have to be tougher with ourselves is that God was calling them out because they represented him. Jesus was calling them out because they represented God in his program. And they were misrepresenting God. So they needed to hear it. So Jesus continues to teach. And while he's doing that, in the background, the Jewish leaders are plotting. They're plotting. He knew it. He knew it. He threw down the gauntlet and said, all right, let's watch the wheels move. And it didn't take very long. He was fully aware of all this. Did he run? Did he hide? Did he try to push somebody out in front of him? No, he waited for it to come. He gave one last great sermon. It's called the Olivet Discourse. And he really talked about the future to come. Over in Matthew 26, which I hope I can get to. After that great sermon, we read this in verses 1 through 5 of Matthew chapter 26. And now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings that he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man, and again, that's a a name he called himself, the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests, the scribes, the elders of the people assembled at a place of the high priest who was called Caiaphas and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and to kill him. But they said, not during the feast, that's the Passover, lest there be an uproar among the people. And then later that day, we read this over in verses 14 through 16. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Folks, two nights later, Jesus would be arrested and tried. And the next day, he would die on a criminal's cross. None of this was a surprise to him. Not one thing was a surprise to him. And yet... He went willingly to his death because Jesus always was laser focused on his mission. As we remember this Palm Sunday and we look forward to Good Friday, which is the day that commemorates Jesus' crucifixion, and then we look forward to Resurrection Sunday when they came to the tomb early in the morning, and they found it empty. And the angel said, he's not dead. He's risen. Folks, remember how we got there. It's because Jesus had his focus on the mission. And I want to say something to you today as we close. He had his eyes on you and on me. If you're here this morning and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, give him the glory. Because he knew you, and he died for you. And if you're here this morning and you don't know him as your Savior and Lord, let me say this to you. The world's going to tell you all kinds of things and going to give you all kinds of offers. And there's going to be all kinds of people who are going to try to tell you to do this, do that, or do the other thing. But which one of them would die for you? And which one of them have the power to rise again? And which one of them has the ability to give you a relationship with God the Father and the promise of of eternal life. None of them has that. Only Jesus. I can think of no better time than this time of the year. We commemorate Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to come to Him and say, Lord Jesus, I confess my sin to You. I know You died on the cross for me. And Lord Jesus, I believe that and ask You to become the Lord and leader of my life. If you've never done that, 
After we're done with the service this morning, I'm going to encourage you to come talk to me. We can look at a few scriptures together. And you, before you leave this place today, can know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Let's go to Lord in prayer.